Well, one of the things that we do is we, we share together in, in the messy parts of life, which sometimes is the children's sermon, uh, but we also share together in, in all of our lives together as, as a congregation. It's one of the neat things that we do as a church. Um, you can let go of your mass, and you can kind of let know, people know what's going on. So what we'll do is if, if there's any prayer requests, anything that you'd like to share, we'll just uh, let them be said now, and then we'll just do a prayer. So anybody have anything going on in their life? Yeah, Bree. Oh, your friend Callie's here and pray for the trip back. We need to pray for that kid, Becky. He needs an exorcism. Any other prayers out there? Okay, so Jennifer and Jason. It, yeah, and Riley. Oh, that's sad. What's what's his what's her name? Okay, so prayers for Emily. Um, she just lost her brother, and um, one of the the joys that we have in the community is um, Lisa Warren. Warren had her um, baby yesterday, or a few days ago. I'm sorry. Uh, so Jamie and, and Lisa. So they're at home right now, and the name's Johnny Hank. So I got it right this time. Um, also, it's a joy to have Beth here with, with the baby. Mike, you're not a joy because you've been here already. Uh, but I uh, want to say welcome back to you, and uh, beautiful baby, by the way. I made the mistake of calling her a big girl at the first service, and I'm like, she's not a big girl. She's perfectly sized for how she is. So, because you don't say big girl about any girl. Uh, so, uh, right now we'll, we'll do a prayer and I'll uh, start with silence. So, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we're able to come here together, that you have uh, picked us as your people, that we can come and worship you and that we respond to you and, and that you help us to grow in our lives and our walk with you. Lord, uh, guide this time together. May your spirit come and be present with us. Lord, especially we pray for those who are uh, going through some difficult times, especially for Emily uh, as she's dealing with the loss of her brother. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you will just fill her with, with your comfort and be with all those people in her family that are missing him as well. Lord, we thank you for the joys within our community of, of new births, of new babies, uh, of people who are here and, and people who have gotten married. Lord, we lift them up to you. Lord, we, we ask that you will guide us in our walk with you, that you will continually lead us closer and closer to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, th this morning, um, I, I, I kind of took, because last week we had the God's Not Dead movie, so I sold their, their thunder a little bit and put Sin's Not Dead. But... It comes from uh, this this continuing education trip that I had to go on the other day. So most of you have continuing education that you have to go to. And I was talking to a teacher at the 8 o'clock service, and they're like, yeah, we have to do continuing education too. And, and they're, they had the same response that I did. Um, you go there and you want to learn something, and by the time you get there and listen to the speaker, you realize, nope, I'm not going to learn a thing. So that's kind of what this continuing education event was. I was there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and uh, it, it was, the, I didn't learn anything from the speaker, but I had some time to read and, and to be with God and talk with other pastors, so it was a good time. Uh, the thing about it was the, the guy who was the main speaker, he rubbed me the wrong way right at the very beginning. He started with scripture, and as he was reading, he's like, you know that word up there? Uh, I I don't like that word. So I'm going to take out the whole sentence and I'm going to change it to fit what I want it to say. I'm like, oh my gosh, are you serious? You're, he was ordained clergy and he's changing the scripture to, to make it. So that's, that's where we had our first problem. Uh, the thing about it though is he, he, he didn't seem very holy. He didn't seem like he, he was really into Christianity. For him, uh, Christianity was just a way to become good as a person. It was a way of, of reaching a means, I guess. Uh, with him, uh, he was talking about the resurrection, but it wasn't Jesus' resurrection. It's resurrecting the dead parts of your body uh, so that 
they can come to life. I, I didn't quite understand it. But uh, when we were there, I was kind of having this conversation with Pastor Kevin. Uh, and we were sitting at different tables, but he would roll his eyes at something that he said, and then I would roll my eyes, and we kind of sigh and think, oh, yeah, he's just terrible. So this week, as I came to the scripture, uh, I, I noticed that it's, it's just in stark contrast to what I found with this guy. Uh, this week, uh, I, I wanted to bring up just something, you probably have heard this before, but I want to define some things. So in, in our political world, we have uh, liberal, we have uh, independent and conservative. We also have progressive and fundamentalists on the very ends of the spectrum. That's political. But we also have theological categories as well. Now, I'm not one who likes to put people in categories uh, of where they should fall or anything like that, but I, I think it's important today. So in Christianity, Christians have uh, different theological categories. You can be uh, liberal, you can be kind of an independent, and you can be conservative. There's also the, the far end of the spectrum, you can be progressive, and then there's fundamentalist. Um, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm taking a, a guess here, and I would say that most of us here are conservative. Now, when I wrote this, I was thinking, well, there's going to be people who argue, um, you know, I'm not conservative because I'm a very liberal person. I'm very open-minded. I'm not dogmatic in what I believe and, and things like that. The, the thing is, I think we get it tied with our political train of thought a lot of times. So you can be uh, politically conservative and theologically liberal. You can be theologically liberal, politically conservative. Uh, those things don't really need to match up. But I want to boil it down, the difference between a liberal Christian and a conservative Christian, just to begin with. Uh, the first thing is that liberal and, Christ, uh, and uh, conservative Christians, they both believe in Jesus. The difference is that conservative Christians uh, believe that Jesus died and he came back from the dead. Now, a liberal Christian would say, yeah, Jesus was alive, but it doesn't matter that he came back. It, it, he might have came back, he might not have, but that's not what matters because what matters is he's providing us with a good example that we are to follow. So that's, that's the first thing. Uh, the second way you can tell the difference between a, a liberal and a conservative Christian is, is their understanding of human nature. Now this, this is the one where it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, a conservative says that humans are naturally bad. A uh, liberal says that humans are naturally good. Now this is the one I struggled with because I'm, I'm an optimistic person. And so I thought, well, no, no, no. Um, humans are good. That's what I thought initially. But as, as you go through life, you can kind of see how things tend to spiral downward. Uh, somebody at the 8 o'clock service, she's a teacher, and she said, we have this new system in place where we put all the kids, um, the good kids and the ones that need more work, we put them all in the same class. And she said, you'd be amazed that the good kids don't bring up the other kids. In fact, the opposite happens. The, the good kids are usually dragged down by the other kids. I, at the eight, 9 o'clock service, I, I accidentally call them the bad kids. But they're not bad. There's no such thing as a bad kid. Um, but, but that's what happens, is that you have people being dragged down by others. So Christianity, it really gets under the skin of our culture. And the reason why is because we have truth that we believe in. Uh, the, the pastor there that was given the presentation, he said this. He said, a lot of people don't come to church because they think that Christians have all the answers in life. So what we need to do is start telling people we don't have any answers. I was thinking, well, why would you do that? That makes you exactly like everybody else. We live in a world that's vague. You know, there, there aren't any real hard answers. It's the gray area that we all kind of live in. That's, that's a problem because Christians, while we disagree on, on kind of secondary issues, um, secondary being like the, the issues with homosexuality, abortion, things like that, we can disagree, and that we're still fine. We're, we're still on the same page. But there's one truth that you have to hold to, and that's Jesus died and he came back. I mean, without that, you're basically preaching, okay, just be good people, uh, have good morals, and that's it. So I'm going to read to you this scripture today, and I'm going to probably mess up a little bit when I read it, because I'm reading it from the NIV, and I'm reading it from the, I'm sorry, the NRSV. 
And it's a wooden, uh, very difficult kind of sounding version to read. I'm reading it because it's closer to the actual uh, Greek that it was written in. So uh, listen for God's word. It says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourself and all your conduct. For it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You do not know that you were ransomed. You know that you were ransomed, uh, ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with his precious blood, like that of the lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have to come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your soul by obedience to the truth, so that you have general, genuine mutual love, love each other deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not a perishable but imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The word is good news that was announced to you. Uh, let's take a moment and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be here. Bless this time. Bless this. Pastor, bless these words. Amen. I was right, wasn't it? It's, it's a harder interpretation to read, but we got through it. Uh, so every sermon that you write, it's kind of like a theme paper where you should have a main focus for, for the, the day. So here's the main focus. I don't usually tell you, but, but this is it. Um, inward belief is shown by outward behavior. So if you want to write that down somewhere, I'll, I'll kind of reference it back. So inward belief is shown with outward behavior. So if I believe that I'm going to die in, in six to eight months, I will act a different way in my life. You know, I, I had a second cousin who had cancer, and she knew she was going to die. And so what she did was she took trips. She took a lot of pictures. She wrote things to her kids who were only a few years old. She made sure that she made the most of things. Now, if my kid sneezes on my food, if I believe that they sneezed on my food, I will not eat it, you know? That's, it's just natural. And, and if I believe in Jesus, then naturally my life is going to be different. Peter, what, what he's doing is he's talking to these people, and they're, they're living in this world where nobody else is Christian around them. They're being oppressed from all sides. And so he's saying, okay, so if you believe what... I'm saying here, if you believe in Jesus, then there has to be something happening in your life as well. And so he says this. He, he has four things that he encourages Christians to do. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. So a, as a church here, we have one mission, and we, we hold that above all other missions here. It's to make disciples. We're trying to get a, a process going. How do we make disciples? What does it look like? How do we get there? Uh, the thing about it is, disciple-making starts with growth. You know, how do you grow as a Christian? How do you grow into the knowledge of Christ? So we do Bible studies. Now, we do Bible studies not to just sit around and have coffee with each other. We do Bible studies so that we learn who Christ is, and we have uh, a knowledge of the hope that is to come. We prepare our minds for action. Now, I love that phrase. We prepare it for action. When I was a kid... And I was going to a church. Actually, I wasn't a kid. I was dating Meredith at the time. who's not paying attention. I was, uh, oh, she's filling out things. I apologize. Uh, but I, I went to her church. And, and at the time, I, I know they're different now. But at the time, I, I was thinking to myself, well, they do all these Bible studies. They do all these things. And they don't do anything. You never go outside the building. You just stay inside and kind of huddle in. And I thought, what a waste. You know, I don't want to be this kind of Christian. I, I want to be one that actually goes out and does something with their faith. If I'm going to believe something, I need to go out and physically do something along with it. So that's why I like that. We prepare our mind for action. We're not going to just come here and sit in a pew. 
we're not going to just sit here and, and be still and quiet. I think that's what we all want our kids to do, but our kids want to get out and, and move. And that's what we should be doing too. So we, we actually kind of inverse the teaching here in church. We tell them, sit down and be quiet, be still. But what God's saying is get out of the doors and do something about it. So that's, that's the point of the church. You don't come here just to soak everything in like a sponge. You come so you learn how to go out and do. And you do this so that way you conform to the image of God. And then when you conform to the image of God, then you can go out and bring thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. You know, there's some action in there. The second thing that Peter says to do, if, if you're living in a world that's kind of ungodly, you're supposed to be holy. So being holy means that you are set apart. That's a, what the literal translation, translation means. You're set apart for something different in the world. There's something noticeably different about you. So here's the deal. Uh, I think Christians kind of fall on different spectrums, when it, uh, different places on the spectrum when it comes to this. You have some people that are so holy, so um, godly, that they're hypocrites. And they're, they're kind of see them as, as jerks, really. They, they just look down on everybody else because they're that holy that they're just so much better than you. You have that in some denominations. Uh, Jesus actually uh, basically says that to the Pharisees. Well, you go to the temple and you pray and you say, hey, look at me, I'm so awesome, I'm better than that guy over there. Jesus really, uh, he says, no, that's not the way to do it. The problem is, is that many mainline denominations like, like this one, instead of saying we're hypocritical Christians, we go the opposite way and we become lukewarm. And so we really look like everybody else. It's both, uh, both ends of the spectrum are, are bad places to be at. You've heard the phrase frozen chosen. Well, that's what, that's what we are sometimes, you know. We just sit in our pews. We, we don't look any different from anybody else. And I don't know why that is. I think sometimes we're too complacent. Uh, sometimes I think we need a swift kick in the butt. Sometimes I, I think we're just afraid of being that other guy who's condemning. But there is something to be said about living holy lives. Um, I can tell you this. At every church I've served, there's always somebody who is a, a, an example of what it looks like to be holy. And, and I've used your name three times, so I better use it, or two times, so I better use it again. Uh, Grandma Betty. We all know Grandma Betty, right? In, in Drake's film. Now, if you don't know her, she's a great lady, Betty Jones. When you're around her, there's something natural about being around her. I mean, she, you just feel loved. You feel like you're an important person, that you're special. And every church that I've been at, there's somebody like that. Now, Grandma Betty, what's nice about her is if you're, if you're doing the wrong thing, she'll tell you. She's not going to just let it slide, which that's part of being holy. You hold people accountable. So that's how you stand apart. You're noticeably different from those around you. The next thing that Peter says, if you're living in a world that's not very godly, you should fear God. Now, when I say fear God, a lot of people are like, well, I don't know. That sounds kind of bad. Why should you fear the God who created you? God's love. Shouldn't be any fear about it. We have three kids, and all the three kids except for Beckett, when they hear the words one, two, three, they know that at three, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, there's punishment coming. We're not going to beat them. Um, Beckett's in the process of learning how to do that. Instead, when, when we say one, he lays on the floor like a dead fish. But um, he stays there the, the whole time. Um, but they eventually learn that by three, something's going to happen. And, and they typically go into timeout. Now, I think the worst part of timeout for kids is not that they're removed from everybody else. But there's a disappointment there. Like, I, I messed up. I'm, my mom and dad are upset with me. There's guilt there. Now, when it starts being pushed into shame, that's bad. But guilt is okay. It's a proper response to, to disappointing somebody. So fear, fearing God is it, kind of like that, oh, man, I disappointed God on this one. I really messed up. There's guilt there. And that's how we should fear God. You know, it's, it's a, uh, I want to make my Father in heaven happy. You know, I want to do all that I can. And there's also a fear that, you know, someday you'll be held accountable for everything that you've done. Peter's final encouragement is, is to love one another. 
I was reading this week, and it said that many churches are experiencing a fellowship crisis. And it's true. When you look at a lot of the churches around, uh, it looks almost identical to the Rotary Club or to a, a golf club. Uh, we have this structure in place that was put in there in the 50s, um, kind of archaic, but it has a hierarchy that basically negates any kind of love that you could have. Now, church is supposed to be a place where you're authentic, you're real, you're genuine with people. We don't have authentic fellowship in church like we should. Uh, church should be like the family, should be an extension to your family. And, you know, if, if anybody's ever been to a family reunion, like almost all of us have, uh, 80% of the family reunion's really good, but 20% of it's really bad. You know, everybody has that crazy Uncle Bob, you know, kind of like Uncle Eddie. Um, you accept them for who they are. Yeah, Uncle Bob's over there. He's in his underwear. You know, but that's who he is. And, and church is the same way. We have a lot of people who are just kind of a little bit different. You accept them for who they are. But the thing is, you also hold them accountable because we're not okay with with sin. We, we want to help you grow into the person that you want to be, that God wants you to be. Now, here's the key. With all these four things that Peter's recommending, he said uh, basically he's doing this to, to help people who are living in an oppressed society. He's saying if you are in an ungodly place, then you need to start acting godly. And so here's what you do. You first have hope, and hope comes from understanding God's word. Second thing is you are holy. If you're going to believe it, then you've got to be set apart. Third is that you fear God, and fourth, you love each other. So all that goes back to that statement that I said before. Inward belief is shown by an external action or external behavior. Now, you're, you're probably wondering, why did I have that story about the continuing education and, and all that stuff beforehand and liberal, political, conservative? Uh, the reason why I, I said that is because the world we live in and, and that speaker, they, they seek to create a world that's vague, a world that uh, kind of lives in the gray. In the world, uh, you have many different people telling you how you should live. You know, you got Oprah on TV. Uh, you have CNN. You have Fox News. Uh, you can pick your poison there. You have all these people telling you how to live. And, and how, how do they get their information? What do they base it off of? Well, what they do is they, they value people as rational human, human beings. And they take a consensus view. Well, this is what most people think. And so I'm going to take that and expound upon it. And that's what you should think as well. The problem is, is, is that as Christians, we don't believe that people are rational. People are, by their nature, sinful. And so what you see is it's continually pushing against morality. And so morals get lower and lower and lower. Uh, take a look at television. A few years back, you couldn't find, uh, you'd have some swear words on television, but not as many as you have today. Now I think there's maybe two or three uh, swear words that you can't say on TV. When I was outside the other day, I was uh, just working in the yard, and there's a group of middle schoolers riding by on their bike. And as they were riding by, I, I thought they were a bunch of sailors. I mean, they were just swearing all over the place. What happens is, is morality gets lowered in a general area, and then it gets acted out by others. What we see in, in society is, is that freedom is, is viewed as freedom from restraint. So, Miley Cyrus, twerking. You know, you have things like that. And, and that gets shown on TV. And, part, uh, and then sooner or later, that becomes the norm. It's no longer shocking enough. And so there's something else that's even more shocking. And so we continue to push and to push and to push until morals get lower and lower and lower. Yet as Christians, we believe that there is a right and there is a wrong. There's a right way to live and there's a wrong way to live. Now, it sounds really odd, and, and it, it just sounds terrible because we think of God as God of grace, God of love. But the, the thing about Christianity is it begins with the fact, uh, with the belief that humans are sinful. So if you want to know the entrance point into true Christianity, it begins with humans being sinful. Everything else builds on top of that. So if humans were good if we were good by our very nature, if we were always going to do the right thing, 
then we wouldn't need Jesus, right? We'd be good enough. He'd just be a good example. But if you believe that humans are, by their nature, sinful, then we need repair. We need uh, restoration, redemption. We need something to save us from the condition that we're in. Uh, I started this sermon uh, talking about that, that guy who was so vague in what he believed and, and, and things like that. That natural ability to see people as good, it just doesn't work. You and I are in need of a savior to bring us from the condition that we're in. Uh, one of the Reformation fathers, this is my favorite thing I learned in seminary, um, he called us mouse poop mixed with pepper. Uh, something that has no worth whatsoever. Mouse poop mixed with pepper. You can take that one and use it wherever you want this week. And I believe that, you know, Christians, we believe that humanity is depraved, which is wicked and evil. It, it sounds terrible, but when you think about it, it's true. You know, deep down, we know there's some truth to that. On our own, we continue to spiral into, uh, into terrible things. You take a look at World War II. You, you take a look at what happened over in Afghanistan with, with uh, tyrants and dictators and, and despotism. I mean, there's a reason why we have rules and, and guidelines, and there's leaders out there who are really protecting us because... On our own, there will be one person who rises up, gains power, and you know, does terrible things. So as a culture, we see this downward spiral with morals, just like it did in Peter's time. Now, the, the good thing about it is uh, this all ebb, ebbs and flows. So right now, we're at a low point in our morality. Uh, someday, it will come back up. Someday, it will come you know, back and forth, hopefully. But... As Christians now, we have to fight for the way we live. We have to make a stand. We have to be more than just Christian by name. No more of the lukewarm stuff. We're called to live in a way that proclaims that we actually believe in the truth. Now, we might disagree on other little things, but we are called to believe in the truth of Jesus Christ, that he died and was raised again. We're still sinners, but we're constantly at work trying to be like Jesus so that we can show his love. Now, it's, it's pretty fitting that we're having communion today because part of communion uh, reminds us of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, if you did something wrong, what would happen is you'd, you'd have to find a lamb or, or, or an animal that was a, without blemish. Then you take it to the temple, and what would happen is they would sacrifice it. And, and this was the way that you were cleansed of your sin. Now, what Jesus does is he becomes that lamb. He becomes the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, it's, it, it, just, it doesn't make sense in our worldview because that's not the way we view it. But it makes sense when you look at how God designed all this. So Jesus came and he became the sacrifice once and for all for our sins because we are sinful. We are in need of a Savior. So on that night, so many years ago, Jesus was sharing a meal with his disciples, and he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you, for the forgiveness of sins. And likewise, after the supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink of this, all of you, this is my blood the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus believed in our sinful condition. He knew we were in need of a Savior. And so his sacrifice allows us to be restored. And Jesus said, whenever you eat this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim me until I come again. And so that's what we do today. We proclaim that we are sinners, that we're in need of Christ that we are coming to be restored and to be redeemed. So the ushers come forward. And within the Methodist Church, we practice open communion, which we see as a, a way of grace, inviting all to God's table. It's a way to encounter the risen Lord. So you may come, the table's ready.